This is Robert Glasscock, and I am very excited to tell you that I'm going to be in Chicago on July the 8th for an all-day seminar with the Friends of Astrology group in Chicago. For more information, friendsofastrology.org. And I hope to see you in Chicago. Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. I'm Thomas Miller, and we have another great listener question. Hi there, Thomas and Robert. Your Old Soul, New Soul Podcast is the highlight of my week. Every episode that comes out, I it's like a present. So I have a question today about configurations like fingers of God and how to make them really work for us. For an example, I happen to have one with a sun at two degrees Taurus, Mars at two degrees Virgo, and Uranus at three degrees Sagittarius. And I've been trying to work it out, but I'm really wondering how to to turn these things so that we're living our highest timeline, so that we really have a choice to make things good, and also to really help the people in our lives. Oh, and my rising is Leo, um, six degrees Leo. All right. Thank you. You guys are awesome. (laughs) Have a good day. Bye. Well, Robert, I don't know what you're going to do to answer this, but I'm just flattered by what this precious lady has said about what we're doing in here. (laughs) (laughs) So am I. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) Man, wow. Very complimentary. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, too. All right, let's talk about this, because I think maybe, now well, let's paint word pictures here, but I think maybe we don't have the finger of God or the witch's hat or the yod. <laughs> well, it's a little confusing, and maybe maybe the finger of God configuration is very simple. It is two planets in sextile with a third planet opposite the midpoint of that sextile. And that third planet then inconjuncts both ends of that sextile. So that's the finger of God. And what she has when she gave us the gives us this information with six Leo rising, she has Mars in Virgo at two degrees in the first house, but on the second cut. So Mars, she says, is at two Virgo. And then she mentions Uranus is at three degrees Sag. Well, Mars and Uranus in her chart are square each other, and there is no square in a finger of God configuration. And then she mentions her sun in Taurus at two degrees, and it trines her Mars at two degrees Virgo. And again, in the finger of God configuration, there are no trines either. But here is what I love about her question. I'm a big believer. Look, no matter what you or the old books call any of these configurations, the finger of God, the mystic cross, doesn't matter what they're called. If you can understand the basic energies of the planets themselves, each planet represents a different type of energy archetype. If you can understand those, and you can understand how to associate the planets with the houses that they rule, in the natal chart. And then you can understand the basic meanings of the aspects, whether they're hard or soft, whether they're squares or conjunctions or oppositions or trines or sextiles and so on. If you can understand just the basics, you can think your way, yourself, through any configuration. So in her chart, she doesn't have a finger of God configuration, but what she does have, think it through, her Mars energy, Mars in Virgo, which loves to work. If she can find something that really calls to her heart, which is what she's always looking for in life with that squared to Uranus and Sagittarius. But nonetheless, the Mars and Uranus energies are in a square aspect. That means they're in conflict. And the conflict may simply be that with Uranus and Sag, like me or you or a lot of others, Uranus rules uh, astrology, among other things, but it's originality. It's uniqueness. And and so the side of her that has that kind of mind, that astrological mind, and that sort of cutting edge mind that's interested in things both very ancient and also very advanced, 
that yearning to express her originality through Uranus is in conflict with her Mars in Virgo, which needs to have a job. See what I mean? So there's a conflict that is meant to motivate her to resolve it. And one way to resolve it might be become an astrologer. Then you have the Mars square Uranus very active. And, and hard aspects are always action active. So being an astrologer or a metaphysician, she could read tarot, she could read anything. But in this field, that Mars and Virgo square Uranus energies would find a really good outlet. At the same time, she has her son in the ninth house. That So do I. So do a lot of us. That son in the ninth house can predispose to an interest in and study of areas like astrology. Even she could wind up teaching this stuff someday. But the, the sun in Taurus trying her Mars in Virgo means that her life force, her sun, that energy, is in a harmony, harmony with her Mars, her work and vocation, her actions, in other words. It's only the side of her, that Uranus side in her fourth house, that makes her constantly restless to keep looking over the fence, looking over the horizon, keep aiming higher to find something more fulfilling and exciting and stimulating in her inner mind and in her work. So that keeps her, uh, if she's unaware of it, dissatisfied all the time, instead of taking the Mars square Uranus energy and actually doing creative work. It doesn't have to be full time. It doesn't even have to be for money. But Mars square Uranus, when she finds something, maybe astrology is it, but something like this that really fascinates her, and she begins to build on it and expand it, then she'll be she'll be happy. The tendency, though, with Mars square Uranus in this configuration, Thomas, is that real life keeps interfering with the side of her that really wants to be free to just devote herself to these creative and metaphysical pursuits. I hope that helps. Darn that real life. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> you have to get up into your 60s or 70s before you figure it out and put it back in its place, right? And it's it like, then it's... Well, then I've we got to start over Neptune. when we come back. <laughs> <laughs> I have a sun conjunct Neptune in Libra. What do you want to know? <laughs> so it took me a little while to learn, you know, Bob. <laughs> well, Thank heaven for astrology. This is great because picking apart each one of these legs, and then we're not putting it back together in the yod. And I'll tell you what let's do, Robert. Let's take another episode, the next one down, and we will pick the yod apart by itself, because I don't think there's any aspect in astrology that I can think of that has the mystique that the Yod does when we talk about it on Fun Astrology. It just has this mystery around it or this fascination well, with the Yod. You know, Tom, look at the name, Thomas. How could it not? Whoever called this originally called it the finger of God. It makes it sound like, oh, this is going to be the key to my life. It's some direct message from God. It isn't any more than any other message in the chart, but it's got that name. And so everybody thinks it's something special. It also is called the witch's hat. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and we all remember the good old days in Salem, Massachusetts. There's God and the devil all in one aspect there. So it's like, and it, and actually that is the yod, which we'll talk about next time. But before we get there, let's talk about the quincunx or the inconjunct there, oh. which is, yeah. How do you read into that? It's my favorite aspect. Um, it really is. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Yeah, go. <laughs> All right. The, the nature of the inconjunct of the quincunx is a first, sixth, or a first, eighth house relationship. So inherent in the inconjunct are two things, work and occupation, sixth house stuff, and health. And by health, I mean mental, spiritual, psychological, and physical health. Look at what already is combined in just the inconjunct aspect. If you also add to that the eighth house subtext, remember an inconjunct. If you, if you place a planet on the first house, then the inconjunct goes to the sixth house and to the eighth house. So those influences are all built into any inconjunct aspect. It's an aspect of frustration. I call it, I like to call it 
divine frustration or divine discontent is maybe a better word. The two planets at each end of the inconjunct are not in harmony, but they are not nearly as much in conflict as those same two planets would be in a square or in opposition. But an inconjunct aspect are two planetary uh, energies that are not in harmony. They So it was what they mean is perpetually, all of your life, you will experience restlessness, dissatisfaction, frustration, and challenges, not necessarily to a, a dramatic degree, but constantly in the areas that are ruled by the two planets in the inconjunct and also the houses that they rule so that constant adjustments are necessary, usually involving communications of some kind. So that it's that divine discontent underneath the aspect itself, the inconjunct, that partakes of the nature of the sixth house and the eighth house. Well, we know what the eighth house is. It's other people's money, so that's part of it, because these are aspects of work and occupation and money and health and so on. But the eighth house is about transformation. It's a Scorpio house. So the eighth house kind of in conjunct, the, the fact that every in conjunct partakes of both the sixth and the eighth houses, the in conjunct itself, just one of them, contains the promise of transforming that frustration, that divine discontent into something that's constructive and successful it's meant to that's why i call it divine discontent it's meant to motivate you to look at why you are frustrated with these areas of life and then think about what you can do and use astrology to help you think it through what you can do to resolve the frustration because when you do that think it through and then take the actions what you're doing is basically flipping the in conjunct over into something very uh, constructive as opposed to anxiety ridden anxiety is very common within conjuncts so in effect the inconjuncts invite you to think about those areas and transform them make some important changes in whatever those areas are that are ruled by it i don't now if you get into the finger of god you've got two inconjuncts you have one planet that is in conjunct two planets that are sextile to each other, you see. So if you want to think about it that graphic way that we were, if you place a planet on the first house, the finger of God will look like this. You will have another planet in the eighth house and another planet in the sixth house. And both of those planets in the eighth and the sixth are in sextile to each other. But the one planet over there in the first house is in an in conjunct aspect to both ends of that sextile. I love the finger of God because look at the sextile built into that aspect. That's an aspect of growth, of permanence, stability, success, opportunity, expansion. That's the sextile. So those two planets will be working in harmony. And the houses that they rule each of those planets will also give you clues about how to be harmonious and constructive or what areas of life to take advantage of or apply these things to. So both of those planets in harmony are an op opportunity aspect. And now you've got the finger of God, that third planet on, on the ascendant. And that really is the fulcrum of the finger of God, that one planet that is opposite the midpoint of the sextile and in conjunct both ends of the sextile, that one planet will be the key to taking advantage of that sextile. In other words, taking advantage of what the, the so-called finger of God is pointing you to. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and then tie the quincunx tension into that pinnacle planet, that one that's in the first house. Well, once again, it's going to be in an aspect of disharmony with the planet in the first house. And the other end of the sex, I mean, the other end of the sex, the planet, let's say, in the eighth house position to the to the fulcrum planet, that's also going to be in, in, in conjunction. So both of those planets are out of harmony with that singleton. 
But the two planets that are out of harmony with the singleton are in harmony with each other because they're former sextiles. So now that fulcrum planet becomes, in essence, opposite the midpoint of the sextile. And this is a key throughout astrology. If you have a square in your chart anywhere, divide the square by two, you get 45 degrees, get the midpoint between the two planets that are in square to each other, and that midpoint will fall in a house axis that will give you tremendous clues in how to resolve that square in your life. Or in that situation, if it's an orary question, midpoints are really, in, many astrologers don't use them. But this finger of God takes midpoints into account because the, the actual full term planet is opposite the midpoint of that sextile between the other two. But see how it's got all that built into it. It's all about work, six house, eight house stuff, as well as opportunity and growth. So I, I it's not that the uh, finger of God is is easy or or less maybe frustrating but if if you can consciously study it a bit and understand what it means it can point you to tremendous like discovering hidden treasure in your life all right these are great thoughts from robert thank you very much we're going to pivot here and go to part two and focus specifically on the yacht itself so this will conclude part one we'll see you over in part two for the yacht